to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to A Well-Designed Business. The one and only Toby Fairley joins me today. I am happy to have Toby on my show. If you listen to her podcast, Design You, then you know I was on her show, episode number 37. And if you haven't found her podcast yet, I suggest you do. When Toby and I get together, we can get a little fired up about helping you run your businesses more profitably. Our core message is, we want you to create a business that is right for you and a business that makes money. Before I tell you a little bit about Toby's career, let me remind you about our sponsor, Article.com. You know who Article.com is. It's your resource for Scandinavian mid-century furniture, office furniture, living room, dining room, outdoor furniture. And I'd love for you to go and check out my brand new book, A Well-Designed Business to Power Talk Friday Experts, and check out that Sven Share by Article.com on the cover in hashtag podcast green velvet. That's right. You can learn more about Article.com and their trade program by going to welldesigned.article.com. That's welldesigned.article.com. Okay, so if you're not familiar with Toby Fairley, then you're probably new in the industry, but Toby is known for her interior design, and she is also known as a progressive thinking entrepreneur. Toby is passionate about both her full-service interior design company as well as her consulting firm because with both, she is focused on helping clients design their homes, their businesses, and their lives. She has a special interest in pro- promoting wellness and balance for entrepreneurs CEOs, and creatives. Her award-winning interior design, product design, and ideas have been featured on television and in publications worldwide, including House Beautiful, Veranda, Traditional Home, Huffington Post, HGTV, The Wall Street Journal, Southern Living, Better Homes and Gardens, Real Simple, Coastal Living, Southern Cottages, Creative Live, the Chicago Tribune, and MSNBC. In 2017, Toby was a columnist for the Traditional Home Magazine with a feature in each issue chronicling her own home renovation and reveal. Toby was also on the forefront of the design blog movement when she launched her blog over 10 years ago. Currently, it is read in more than 125 countries worldwide. She has been a trusted coach for over 10 years for interior designers and creatives through her live events, design, and business courses and online programs. In 2018, she launched the podcast, The Design You Podcast, where she helps interior designers and creatives say no to busy and say yes to health, wealth, and joy. In her podcast episodes, Toby shares best business practices, her personal journey as a working mom, and her beliefs about personal development for creating your best life, best business, and nicest home. So I would love to introduce you to Toby Fair. Hi, Toby. Thanks so much for joining me on a well-designed business today. Oh, you're so welcome. And I'm so honored. We've been trying to make this happen for a long time. So I'm so glad to be here. I know. I know. It's crazy. And I have to say that it's funny for me, Toby, because 
I know that, first of all, we've created a nice friendship here. I, I mean, mm-hmm. I feel that way. I hope you agree. I agree. Yes. I totally right? agree. We just hit it off. It was almost like last summer. I remember it was warm the first time I was talking yeah. to you, right? And uh-huh. um, we just hit it off. And, of course, since then we've talked a couple of times. And then, of course, mm-hmm. you had me on your show. And then we have been scheduled a couple times on my end of it. And that's been on me that we've had to reschedule. But the funny thing for me, Toby, is which I don't, you know, you don't have any way of knowing is we started talking as peers and we instantly hit it off and became friends. But you are always like, oh my God, you're always Toby Fairley to me (laughs) because I have been selling your fabrics and have had your books in my showroom forever. (laughs) Thank you. Well, that's so funny. I mean, of course, that's what we work for when we're trying to build a brand. But I don't know if it's just my good Southern upbringing or, you know, my mom and my grandparents and people just tell you, you know, to not get too big for your britches. But I don't ever think of myself that way. I just am like, I'm just a girl and and I'm just running this thing. and, And I love to work with people and I like to connect and... Um, so yeah, we, we have so much in common, you and I, we're, yes, we're it's definitely funny. cut from the same kind of cloth or mold. It's true. And, and I have to say that, um, you genuinely are just like you said, just a sweet Southern girl and there's no oh, airs, there's you. no nonsense. And it's despite the amazing and tremendous success and business and platform that you've created. And so I appreciate that. And I just want to let you know that I'm fangirling a little bit. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Well, I mean, I feel the same way about you. My goodness, your podcast, you've got 8 billion episodes and everywhere <laughs> I go, people like... are like, Luann, 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 Luann. And I'm like, oh my gosh, she is kicking butt. <laughs> And it's awesome. I love well, it. Well, thank you. Thank you. So, and yeah, and the same with you. Your podcast is doing me. I love your podcast. I love that it really does talk into the nuances of some of the things that we do as business owners that we, you know, not so much just the spreadsheet stuff that prevents us from being successful, right? A lot of times on your podcast, you're talking about the headset and the mindset topics yeah. that prevent us from, you know, of achieving what we were intended to achieve. So yeah, I, I was- enjoy it. Yeah. I was kind of born and bred that way. My parents, my dad, honestly, for, I don't even know, he must've been 19 years old when he, you know, first started listening to some of the salespeople and gurus and mm. self-help people. And then I was just raised that way. I remember when I was 12, literally my parents gave me my first set of cassette tapes from Dr. Wayne Dyer. And they're oh like, you God. really need to, you need to listen to these. We are exactly <laughs> the same. Cheers. They're like, you really need to listen to these. Oh um, and then God. I remember being 19 and calling home. I was like, you know, watching a, there was no internet really hardly then barely. We barely had like, Gmail or something in college and uh, or twin I was I don't know in my twenties maybe and I was in college I went to college forever and got a bunch of different degrees so it could have been any time in my twenties <laughs> but honestly for, for calling my dad and it was probably like eleven thirty at night and I'm like hey I'm watching this Tony Robbins infomercial oh my God. and I buy this set of these cassette tape I mean these CDs will you pay for those right. and he's like yes. absolutely and Absol- so I'd drive in my car and literally what a nerd in college I'd be listening to Personal Power Two by Tony Robbins so. Really, I've I've just been kind of, you know, bred that way to be into personal development and self-help. And I know some people think it's very woo-woo, but it's always worked so well for me um, to reach goals and, and, you know, live into my potential and all that stuff. And so I just really enjoy melding that with design and with the business of design. And so I think I'm in my happiest, sweetest spot I've ever been with the work I'm doing with people right now. Toby, you have no idea how cut from the same cloth we are. Of course, the designers listening that really listen to every one of my shows, they know darn well that I started at 10 years old with the Ogmandino collection. So this is the greatest salesman of the world, the greatest miracle of the world. Okay, and from there, I was the only kid in seventh grade that knew the erroneous zones because I read Dr. Dwayne Dwyer, the erroneous zones. <laughs> had that book, I still remember what he looks like on it when he had one here, the little circle on the front. Exactly, the exactly. White with like blue. Blue, it was a it. blue book. It absolutely was a blue book. <laughs> oh, I remember all of that stuff. Isn't that so funny? It's the truth. Yes. And, and, 
Tony Robbins, I say anytime, like I'm on a lot of other podcasts, other business podcasts, and they'll be like, Luann, is there a quote or a business mantra? And I'm like, well, I've got two for you. We've got Ogmandino, I will persist until I succeed, and I've got Tony Robbins, all I need is within me now. I mean, honestly, oh. it's like burned in my brain. Yay. It's hysterical. And my dad was big Earl Nightingale and big Oh big yeah. Stiller. So one of my favorite quotes is, the way to get what you want is to help other people get what they want. Love it. And that's a Zig Ziglar Zig quote. Ziglar. And that's what I, I fall back on when I'm helping and serving other people in the business coaching and life coaching. And because it really, not only is it fulfilling, but it does make me money as well. And so that's really the truth. Like if I get to pour everything I have into other people, it just, it comes back to me in a million times, you know, um, in a million different ways that that it wouldn't if I was really just serving myself. That's right. It's the truth because in The Greatest Salesman, it's what you do comes back tenfold. So it's so true. And I have a, a, a more obscure one, and I'm curious if you know it. James <laughs> Allen as Man Thinketh. Yes. Ah, I think I, you I, are a true, true blue. So <laughs> burgundy with like a cream front with a little burgundy like – pinstripe and around it's it or tiny something. it's tiny it's like half yes. of a book size it's small I even have it right here behind me on this bookshelf oh, i think I'm, i mean we are wow it's yeah okay. that's People crazy like, okay y'all are nerding out move on with the podcast that's ladies. it that's it that's <laughs> it but it's true toby because you know what i have to say and i'm sure it, it, it you've experienced the same thing I know for a fact that this is an amazing foundation that I was raised on through my mother and my aunt, honey. My, and these are the women that exposed me to this. I had men in my life. My father is in my life. It's, I always mention these two women because they were the one that would, they were the ones that would bring these things to me. And it really does influence who you are, who you become, how you look at the world, how you evaluate your own value in the world. And yes. then, then what happens is when you work with people, the way you do in your courses and your coaching and your uh, groups and so forth. It's, mm -hmm. it's helping them find that in themselves, right? Right. Well, you know, and well, a couple things there. First of all, the fact that, that your mother and your aunt were so progressive because mm -hmm. my mom listened to it too, but because I think my dad introduced it to her, but most of that stuff, you know, for With people my parents' age, right. and I don't know how old your parents you know, are, or would be my, my parents are in their seventies, but Mine too. um, yeah, it was coming from sales yep. and business. So, mm -hmm. wow. How progressive of the ladies in your life. But I, on that note, you're exactly right. And one of the things that I love to do is I feel like I'm so fortunate. And it sounds like you are too, to have just unconditional support mm -hmm. at home and not mm -hmm. everybody has that. Mm -hmm. And so I know that kind of foundation and that kind of thinking and pouring into me the same thing that sounds like happened to you or what really made me mm -hmm. be able to be so successful. And so that's one of my favorite things to give to other people because it doesn't have to come from your parents. It sure is hard when it does not for people right. and they have to overcome that, but you can have somebody pour into you, mentor you, support you in, at any age. And it can really be anybody that connects with you and has that kind of an, you know, um, information and resources that you need to hear. And so I just love, love, love doing that for other people. Absolutely. I agree with you. It, de it does. It, it, you're so right. It's so, it's such a tremendous gift when it comes mm -hmm. from your family and your parents, but it really can come from anywhere if you're open to it and you understand mm -hmm. that it is the way it is the way through. It is the way through is to understand that every human being is entitled to be valued and you are one of those people. And as soon as you accept that and you get that, then all of a sudden you, then you can do what you're talking about. You turn around and say, okay, I accept that in myself. How do I share that and help somebody else mm -hmm. understand that? Right? Because that's where the magic yes. happens when you can exactly. help for you and them. That's yeah, what I'm for saying. Both of you. Right. I mean, it's just as, rewarding for me as it is for the person exactly. that I'm teaching or mentoring. And it's so great. Exactly. Exactly. I love it. I think it's hysterical. <laughs> it's, funny. it's so funny. I mean, like, honestly, we could probably spend three hours. Oh just yeah. Do we have to talk to design business? Because we could what's just. On our, what podcasts we <laughs> listen to and like what age we listen to, like what seminars we went to and know, the whole thing. I am going to ask you one more just to see, because if you have okay. this too in your background, I'm going to fall over. Did, were you exposed to the Silva method? Oh, I don't know if I, 
I was. That sounds okay. kind of familiar. Who okay. created the Silva method? Yeah, so it's 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 the Silva method. Now this is not so much mindset, right? This uh -huh. is more um, a practical way to learn how to increase your memory to and, and it it's not increase your memory. It's called increased memory, but it really is how to trigger memory. It's a, a way I'm to... I'm sure my dad probably knows the whole system, whatever it is. Yes. And he probably is like, oh yeah, and... In, in in module eight, so yes. and so happens. Yeah. You know, it's a it whole series. Familiar. It used to be in the seventies. It was called Silva mind control. You uh -huh. see, and you know nobody likes that word anymore, right? So now right. it's called the Silva method. But it was like you train yourself to wake up on uh, whatever time you want. Like I, I don't need, I don't use an alarm clock. I don't care if I go to sleep at two o'clock in the morning awesome. or eleven uh -huh. o'clock at night. I, whatever time I decide I'm going to get up, I say I'm going to get up, and that's when I get up. You know what I mean? Cool. So it's a whole thing of training your mind to work at its peak level I of performance that. Yeah. i love peak performance stuff i'm really like in you know in current uh day gurus i love all the brendan burchard work all the high performance habits peak performance stuff um and i've done some other things that have to do with the mind and memory i've done some stuff with a guy named jim quick who's really into um a lot of stuff about your memory and reading and um, you know, there's all these tools you can learn to help you, like mental associations that help you. Um, and, and he works with people like, you know, gosh, Bill Clinton and just, mm. you know, big time successful people like him or hate him that just have a brilliant mind. And so it's the people that, that you know, that kind of person that he trains to really um, word association names and right. and just just yes. the sharpening of the brain. So That's I'm sure exactly. that the Silva method mm -hmm. probably was a precursor to all mm -hmm. of that stuff. Mm -hmm. yep, so definitely. fascinating. Yes, it's crazy. I'm going to look it up though. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay. So I guess we'll like go on with the podcast. <laughs> so, all right. So Toby, there are several topics that I could have asked you to discuss with proficiency. That's for sure. But I think that we have zeroed in on digital, just digital, digital marketing, yeah. digital presence, di you know, using the digital tools in order to uh, strengthen our interior design businesses and to strengthen our relationships with our potential clients and our existing clients, because mm -hmm. we all know, quote unquote, that we should do it, but it is a little confusing to do. And maybe some people aren't sure that they need to do it. So, right. Talk to us a little bit about your philosophy on this and what it is that you want us to learn. Okay. So the interesting thing is I'm just really, as you can tell, and you're the same way in a lot of ways, always just been really comfortable in progressive thinking. What's the future look like? When you look at my strengths finders test, one of my top five is futuristic. Oh One God. of them is maximizer. I love to <laughs> take things and turn them into something bigger. I mean, if we're going to be perfectly honest, in, they're in this order, activator, achiever, maximizer, oh my God. futuristic, and oh significance. My God. And so all of those things, like I love to take action. I love to achieve. I love to take something and make something bigger or better out of it, which is the maximizing. I love the futuristic thinking, like where are we headed I'm not one that lives in the past a lot. I don't wish things would go back to the way they used to be. I'm always looking at possibility and opportunity. I like things to, to create things of significance or make a difference. And so, um, so I think that what happens a lot with industries like ours um, is it's so easy to be afraid of the future, especially when it comes to technology, when it comes to change. And one of our go-to uh, sort of mindsets about it is, well, that stuff's not that sophisticated. Mm. That stuff is just like the newbies and the people who are, you know, ruining our industry. And or the younger lots, generation, I hear a lot. Young people. Exactly. The millennials and those young people. And, and it's so easy for those of us who are designers, um, who grew up just, you know, enamored with the design icons, like, you know, the Albert Hadleys and the, all of them. Mario Bellotta, them, right. All of them. Yes, Mario, any of them. And we're thinking, well, they would never do this, mm. right? Like they were, that wasn't sophisticated and they would never be, you know, kind of, selling their wares online and it seems dumbed down and it seems um, just unsophisticated. And I think that's such a short sighted 
um, thought process. Because if we're really being honest, what I think is some of those people were such trailblazers for their time, they very likely would have been the first people on Mm. board. Um, But we don't think of it that way because we're associating what we think of those people and how they ran their businesses with the time that they lived in mm-hmm. and and our and life has changed so much in just the last 5 10 15 years right and so i think we're at this sort of pivotal moment where um it's it is it does become scary because you you're looking at this and you're like should i do i do i get on board with that what does that mean does it make me look unsophisticated i've even had people say well toby I don't know. Can I really create like an online course or a program? Because I just heard a big time business consultant in the design industry say no, but no high end designer would ever mm. dumb down their con, you know, their their business to that. Right. And I find that just really so. I mean, kind of funny, very fascinating, but again, very short sighted and really kind of dangerous in that we could as an industry continue to fail to have people go out of business because we're not willing to embrace where the consumer and the technology of today have gone because we're hung up in the past and the way things were done, you know, and that's kind of like to me saying, well, you know, I'm not going to ride in a car because I really think a horse and buggy is better. <laughs> right, right, right. It's the truth. That's how that was good enough for my parents. Take, you know what I mean, right? Like that's that, the thinking. I'm going to take a horse and buggy to spring break next week in Florida. So when it's time to come home, <laughs> I will have just gotten there. <laughs> right. Exactly. So I find it. I mean, I, it's so interesting how we say, tell ourselves these things and we believe it. And as I tell people, you know, just because you create a course or, and it doesn't, you don't even have to do that. You could literally just be marketing yourself online and still have your just regular high end design business or moderately priced design business. But even if we were thinking about a digital asset, like a course or a program, like what about the fact that it's digital makes you think it has to be crap? (laughs) <laughs> right. Mean, like, Great why? point. Because I have things that are digital and I promise you they're not crap because I have really, really high standards and I don't put anything out that's crap, mm-hmm. in my opinion, mm-hmm. you know, that I don't pour my heart and soul into, that I don't put tons of value you in. So I find like some of these thoughts and fears and stereotypes so fascinating um, that we just associate that with poor quality. Because what I want to say is, well, just because you're doing something in person, just because you're doing full service design in person does not mean that it's really a lot of really bad designers in the world. Right. You know, there's right, a lot right. of the are... in person doesn't guarantee that the value and the quality are there. And so like we're, we're, we're kind of painting things with a broad brush when we're acting like, well, online means cheap and stupid and, uh, and not full of value. And in person is, the only way to go like those are not mutually exclusive things you can be both or or you might be neither um and I I just that's kind of the conversation that I really want to bring to kind of the table for us to have a conversation about like why are we so afraid of this why do we not see it as opportunity why can we not see what our versions of this would look like and then the other part of it is because we're afraid to move in some of these directions, then we're allowing people who aren't even from our industry to fill the void because the customer is clearly asking for this stuff. Mm-hmm. So then before you know it, somebody not even in our industry or that is, you know, just, you know, a, some other kind of player like a um, that's not a designer, that's not a creative is starting to create stuff for the consumer even course content and other things because we're not willing to step in. And then we're mad because they're changing our industry. Whoa. Uh, I mean, are we, are we talking without saying who we're talking about or am I just getting a thought to who we're talking about? <laughs> there are several, right? There's several people that are doing things. And, and I'm not necessarily pointing fingers because right. I don't get mad at any of those people. Well, but to your I mean, point though, Toby, you're saying that we're, 
you know, talking about he who shall not be named in the industry, not he, but it who shall not be named in the industry. You know, we're upset with them as an industry, but yet we have not done it ourselves, is your point. And the thing is, the consumer is going that way. And to ignore it is, you know, it's funny because we just had Rachel Cannon on the show a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And Rachel Cannon... It, she's right up your alley. She's she believes everything what you're saying. We didn't have an opportunity to explore it at in depth because we had a different topic going on um, on the show. But she literally, I mean, we said things like, "Well, you know, if you," I said, "Well, that's right. It's like being upset that the car came along. You've got horses. You've got you know a field of horses. You got t- acres of land that you raise these horses on, and you're standing there going, what am I going to do with all these horses?' Well, right. you can stand there all day and be upset upset about it but the car's still going down the road and we don't need as many horses anymore so well yeah and i talk about this too my dad runs a um, family business it's 102 years old now now, and it's a tele it's a telecom business essentially but it was originally landline telephones well who has those anymore no one i don't right um and so then he got into the cable television business and then into the cellular business and the internet business and i mean there were times when we were literally freaking out like he was like telling my mom don't buy don't spend any money (laughs) don't buy the grandkids anything you know like times are changing but he adapted and he Mm -hmm. became a tele you know like a they do all kinds of things now they do um fiber optic cable and the utility side of, mm-hmm. of the, Diversified. the equation and, and they figured it out and right. now their company is worth so much more than it ever would have been. Right. If he just mm-hmm. stuck his feet but, in the ground but, and said, this is not the way exactly. it's supposed to be. Right. And I've even had people who like, when I'm promoting a webinar on some of these topics or something, I've had designers say, you know, well, I'll leave a comment and they'll say, well, those people are ruining our industry and I'll go down kicking and screaming before I change. And I think, well, that's only going to hurt you. Right. And you're going to go because down, not, right? What, what you, it's like right. what I always it's say. You want to be right or you want to get what you want. So exactly. if you want to be right, then, you know, whatever. But if you want to get what you want, you got to adjust, right? Yeah. And I'm not saying that there's not always going to be a version or a model of high-end interior design and people who want things one-on-one and people who want you to procure your product for them but I'm just saying it is changing and I think it will continue to change and there's as opposed to being afraid there's so much opportunity and in fact some of the stuff that we complain about the most like procurement and how hard it is it's like we're trying to hang on to that and I'm kind of just like well what would happen if we just let that go you sound just like Rachel like gonna, <laughs> I think she must be like drinking the Kool-Aid like, right like, okay, fine, and fine, or whoever you want it to be. Like, let them handle that. Like, what would happen? Because, like, for me, you know what would happen? It'd make my life a hell of a lot easier right. when I'm not like, trying to figure out what to do with the busted sofa leg, you know. Right. And the so, the Toby, wrong... let me ask you something about that, okay? So, here's the thing, because I I think Rachel works with you, right? She you she's part of your organization she and your group and so forth. A really great friend and customer for years, and we've worked together, and I've mentored her, and she's inspired me and yeah, yeah she's awesome I love her yeah. I from the day I interviewed her I was like oh you're one of my people now right so but the thing is that again I didn't have the time in that particular episode to explore it but I have had people on the show explain to us how important the revenue stream from product is because it's very difficult to make you know multiple six figures on design fees and that you need the revenue stream from the product are you saying that look i know that you're saying if you if it works for you don't fix it i mean don't break it i mean whatever the hell you say right right if it ain't broke right Right. if it ain't broke don't fix it in other words you're not on you're not here saying everybody should do it my way you're just explaining your opinions your philosophy if somebody is making six figures their way more power to you you're here to say a new future is coming you're having a position on that future and you have a position on revenue streams that might not be the traditional revenue streams, right? Am I understanding correctly where we are right now? Yes. And kind of what I'm saying is if you're in the horse and buggy business and the car has launched, you better start figuring out what you're going to do when nobody else wants any horse and buggies, right? Right. So as long as you can sell product and make a lot of money on it, by all means, please do. In fact, please charge more than what you're charging right now because if you're barely making money on it, it's not worth it. Right. And so many designers I see, you know, are, mark- are making a 
20 or 30 percent profit margin and honestly it might look like it's a lot of money when the gross amount of the check comes in but at the end of the day it's not worth your time no if you're if you're at the end of the day with a 17 percent profit margin because you marked it up 20 percent and then you had some mistakes and you ate a few things you basically made nothing and right. it's the hardest part of the job but if you are able to and willing and have the confidence and the service to make money on product don't stop selling it until you can't anymore. Right. But I'm saying don't wait until the day you wake up and that's n and like 90% of your profit mar of your profitability just evaporated and you're panicking. Start hedging your bets now. Start mm -hmm. looking at the ways that you could take things that you enjoy and your gifts and your talents, your intellectual property and start selling those and packaging those in a way that meets what the consumer wants today because the consumer today doesn't want all as I call it soup to nuts on every project okay I mean if you're looking at the stuff that like I, I thought it was really fascinating as sad as I was that some of my close you know friends and contacts are no longer at like magazines like House Beautiful I thought it was really fascinating to listen to that process and the the shift of that magazine and the new editor that came in and she was talking about the consumer and what she said was you know a few years ago the consumer, the the reader of House Beautiful was getting the magazine, falling in love with the magazine, taking it to their designer and saying, make this happen at my house. Mm. Today's consumer, more often than not for them and reader, is getting the magazine, falling in love with the magazine and saying, how do I do this to my house? Right. And They're going online and figuring shit. out how to get it themselves or looking at the sources yeah. and Googling it and yada, yada. Even if they're not doing all the decorating themselves, they don't necessarily want you to do all of it for them, right? And so that's another thing that I see with designers that we're, that we're, we get mad and we, it's so interesting. It's like, we're mad at the consumer. Like they need to just get out of the way and let me do all of it. But then when we're on the flip side and we're the consumer in a related industry, like I think about for me, the AV, you know, the AV process. And so mm -hmm. when we were building our house a few years ago or remodeling it, it's been about three years now. Um, we needed the AV professional, which we love them and we work with them. And gosh, they're, I feel like they're here every week working on something or adding something. And my husband has fun with all of the toys and the tech, <laughs> and stuff. but he's like, I need you to do the wiring and do all that stuff, but I don't want you selling me the TVs cause I can go to Best Buy or get them on black Friday for a fraction of the cost. So when you get here, I want to have all the equipment here that I can get. And then I want you to do the rest. But in, in the design industry, if our client does that to us, we're like, oh, my gosh, they're a nightmare. Those right. people, total nightmare. It's a red flag. Well, it might be a red flag to work with them in a full service way, but who's to say you can't do another way of working with them? A consulting only or a guide or a course or a program or a, a you know, a call, on a, a, a video conferencing call. I mean, there's so many other ways that we can make really good money and ha give real value to the consumer, but we get so attached to controlling the whole project every, you know, and we're thinking even if half the projects we have or none of them for a lot of designers ever end up finished and portfolio worthy in our mind, if we think they're going to get there. So we absolutely don't want to take on a project that's not going to get there. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Um, and, and so, yeah. Well, but, but that point right there at the, towards the end there, that's a valid point that makes me wonder. So I hear you, Toby, I hear you that, you know, you you can understand that as the consumer, why would I pay the AV guy $1,000 for a TV that I can get on Black Friday for $500? I, what I want is your value and your expertise as the guy that makes all the wires make things happen. I get that. I totally get that. The analogy is the same for interior designers. If you, know, you can come in and create my floor plan for me and tell me what size rug and what size sofa, and I'm going to go get it myself, that's awesome. And I have something to say about that too, because I don't want to in the wrong message. Now, here's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying you take your highest in full service interior design client and turn them into that. You absolutely don't. Okay. But what I think designers do is we try to cram everybody that comes to the door or the phone or the website into this one model, which is full service. And not every customer is supposed to go into that part of our value ladder or our menu of services. Okay. okay. But that's the only one we've got. 
So that's the only place we put them. So do I want you one-on-one -on -one working with a person like this that's going to be a pain in the neck and charging beans for it? Absolutely not. But do I want you to think creatively and think, okay, for all the people who just need that, what could I create? Could I create a video course, a program, something where they hire me as a call and I get a premium for that? Do I want you to drive through their house? No. Do not let people earn working with you at the level of a, of a premium project without paying premium prices and create other places for these other customers to go. And that's the problem because most designers that I see in decorators, they have one thing really um, and they put you into it. And what ends up happening is they end up offering full service that should be worth way more than they're charging. And they're giving it away because they don't think they have another choice because to get the job, they have to sell it kind of for nothing. Um, and what I, and compete on price. And what I'm saying is that customer that wants less than full service gets a different thing entirely. Right. A hundred percent. That definitely makes sense. It's like, it's like, you know, the analogy we use all the time on the show about a steak. You can buy a steak at the store, cook it yourself. You can buy a steak at Friday's or you could buy a steak at STK. You know, it's a piece of meat. The quality goes up with each place, but the service and the value add-ons also go up at each level of what that is. And yeah, so and the beauty of creating a business that is more like it's more accessible online. There are things people can 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 pay for online. There's versions of you they can get. They can get access to the, your intellectual property, your design only. Like there's these other things they can get. The beauty of that is when you can make money in those ways, which a lot of times are so much easier on us when we're not dealing with all of like Honestly, what's worse than procurement for someone who has a tiny budget and every decision for them is life or death? Mm. Like that is the most miserable place to be ever. Like don't buy for that person. Just guide them. Right, right, but right. But for the people who are willing to spend the money, then absolutely do the whole thing. Um, but but what you can start to see when you when you actually put this in practice, and I've done it in my own business and life, and it's so wonderful, is it gets easier to make money at in those other ways for the people who don't want to go all in. And when you start making money with other things, other revenue streams, other services, it balances your cash flow. It gives you a little breathing room and it allows you to be more choosy for the clients that you do go all in with at the highest end. And then you can do a better job. You can wait on the people that have the budget because that's what happens, right? We can't wait. We're like, well, in theory, I'd love that. To we had love to wait on those people, but how do I pay the bills? Well, that's the point. You, instead of just cramming people into that model that aren't a fit for it, you create something different, right? You meet the customer where they are. You listen to what they need and you get, we're creatives. Like we should be able to get creative about how we, solve their problems and there's not only one way to do that but we only kind of think in this one model for the most part right 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 so so the thing is that what's the practical strategy for the design professional that has been told by the you know design panelist icon that you cannot do luxury design and do this package design um, and not mix up your brand well, for one thing, it doesn't mean that the lower end of your value ladder is necessarily for like a low budget customer. Okay. It might mean that the lower end of your value ladder is for the high end customer who's still going to do it themselves, right? Love it. Because there are people, and let's just be clear, there's way more people who take on, especially the place where I live, where there's all this land and we can, you know, urban sprawl, we can sprawl out and have big McMansions and some people still do. There's way more people who do that with the builder and themselves mm -hmm. than people who actually hire a designer to do the whole thing, right? Right. So for that person who's still going to build a million or $2 million house but has no intention of hiring a designer and we think of them as our competition, why are we not making them our customer? Right. But just making it in a different way because the system we use to do it for you, wouldn't that 
that be the same system we would use if we taught you how to do it? Right. But we're afraid to teach somebody how to do it because we're like, well, then it's going to put us out of business. Well, no, the person who was never going to do it themselves is still never going to do it themselves. That's true. And the person who was is always going to, right? Well, that's true. So I think that that's the kind of thinking I'm talking about. Like we are keeping ourselves we're putting ourselves out of business, honestly, and we're mad at the competition, but we're creating the competition in a sense by not offering what people are looking for. Um, and we're being, I think, short-sighted. And I'm not beating us up. I love us. I think we're amazing. I'm trying to like help us like maximize our profits with the thing we already have. Right. Um, and that we're afraid to use because we're we're just we're fearful that. It will put us out of business. And I think it's so fascinating because the thing we're afraid of is kind of already happening because we're not willing to <laughs> use that information, right? It's like a self-fulfilling Self-fulfilling, prophecy. yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. So what's your suggestion that people, because the truth of the matter is, is I think you, you are absolutely right. You said it earlier in your conversation is that it still has to look on brand. If you're going to offer a course or a way to work with you that is not full service luxury, if that's what your brand is and that's who you were, now all of a sudden that experience of having that digital experience with you, coming to your website, engaging, getting information for first, it's the free lead magnet and then the all email sequence yes. and then finally and ultimately, did you want to buy my house who make your bathroom, you know, renovation be happy process or something, right? right? Yeah, because I have to yeah. say, I have renovated uh, several bathrooms in my life, but I've always done it with the same contractor. And uh -huh. he's a good, good friend. And so the reality is, is that when I just had that thought, how to make, how to, rent, you know, redo your bathroom, you know, like renovate it, not just like pick new towels, talking about gut it, right? I have to say, even though I've done it probably three or four times in my life with him, because I've always done it with him, I actually wouldn't know the process. I would, I would guess at it. Let's be serious. I'm not like yeah. a dummy, right? But the yeah. thing is, that because I had such a, uh, I have such a good friendship and relationship with him, I know he's has my back. So it's not like he'd be like, Hey, we're all here to work and there's no tile, Luann. You know what I mean? He right. wouldn't allow that to happen. But if he were ever not to be around, I just had a, a, a moment of, I would not need to hire an interior designer between me and Kim. We're going to make it look fabulous. But if, if Woody, my contractor weren't around, I'd be like, huh? little guy telling me do this first have the make sure the plumber does yeah. that check that would be very helpful yes. you know what i'm saying and i would pay yes. for that because i would say all right like here's this respected interior designer i know her platform i don't need to hire her for this luxurious you know experience but she's selling for 25 bucks first second third fourth in the process right is that mm -hmm. what you're talking about and maybe it's not 25 bucks, right maybe, maybe it's 125 bucks. Bucks, right Maybe exactly. it's two ninety nine. Maybe right. it's seven hundred and ninety nine dollars. Right. It depends on depending how valuable on many details you're giving it to it. Right? Exactly. Yeah. It depends exactly. on how valuable it is. And then the other thing is, what I think is so interesting is the customer today has a ton of options. First of all, right? So if it feels too scary and risky to leap off with a designer at their at their full service, which is kind of the only option we're giving them, it's kind of like, well, you can go in with me for fifty grand or nothing. Right. And and so then a lot of times they're going to be like, okay, well, nothing. Right. But if there was a way for them to enter into the process with us, what if it was even a thousand dollars of something? And then like, we're, but we're not taking it on. We're not dumbing us down. We're not saying I'll give you full service for a thousand. We're saying right. I'm, I'll give you this thing or this process or whatever. Guess what's going to happen? Right. A lot of times. They're going to come back they're and hire get you. In, yeah. yeah. They're going to get in there mm -hmm. and they're going to be like, oh my gosh, she's amazing. And oh my gosh, or he's amazing. And look at all the stuff that's in this program. And when I open the binder and the book and like, there's no way in hell I can do this by myself. Right. Okay, fine. I'm just going to hire her. Because right. clearly she's an expert because look at this program she put together. Exactly. So, and the other yeah. thing too is, Toby, is that I say this all the time on the show. The same consumer will place different value on different projects. So yes. I, if I enter your process and you have some sort of package for, 
walking me through a guest bedroom renovation or a guest bedroom redo, I might say, yeah, low level priority, let me do that. But if I am impressed and that maybe it's, it's five hours of consultation plus a booklet, right? You know, whatever it is. So I get that one-on-one time with you, whether it's FaceTime or it's real in lifetime, but I, it is a finite thing because for my guest bedroom, I'm not really looking for an unlimited budget and for everything to be pretty right. fabulous. But, and I kind of enjoy going online and I might want to buy yeah, I don't that that part, but but fun. some people do. Some people right, want that, right, right, right. But my point is, even for somebody who's a busy person that could, if they wanted to, I don't place a lot of value there. I don't place a lot of priority there. But if you right. come and, and I bought you five hour package from you, plus you gave me the list and I executed, blah blah blah. If that was a good process, when I go to do a more important room, master bedroom or living room, I will just say, hey, let me go right back there because I'm not doing a do-it-yourself right. living room, right? I, that's more well, important to me. Yes. That, so the um, project I just installed last week in Florida, I've been working on for two years um, with a client who found me because originally they had had some poor experiences with a designer or decorator. I don't have any idea who it was. No idea. I never even asked. Uh, but they, I never knew this person. They, they found me online. They found my inbox interior service, which I don't have anymore, uh, but I used to have. And they literally did their entire house with my inbox interior service, the whole thing, every Whoa. single room, like 15, 12 rooms, I don't know, um, in Florida. And then it's not their forever home. It's in a nice neighborhood, but it's not their forever home. And they had been kind of burned by someone. So they were, and she has time. She's busy and she's a stay at home mom and has three kids, but she's like, I kind of enjoy this. I could do this with their guidance, literally did the whole house. And then two years ago, she's like, okay, we're ready to do our dream $2 million Mm. beach vacation home. And we want you to do it soup to nuts. And Mm. they hired me and I just, I've worked with them for two years and they're the dreamiest clients ever. Now we're going back to their house and we're doing a kitchen full, like, full service kitchen right, gut right, right because they right. had a leak and they're like we never did that's the only room in the house we didn't do and let's do that but but so again like you said sometimes it's like well the the regular house is the main house but the, but the weekend cabin we don't want to put a bunch of money right. in or we want to put money in our house but we want you to help our our kids but right. they just are newly married and they want that package or or maybe just I've been burned by a designer and I want to dip my toe in the water and I want to build trust and get some results and when I see I can trust you then actually I may go ahead and hire you for the other thing right um but what it's not and and this is what I, I think the biggest mistake most people make. What it's not is continuing to allow people into our full service business model that really should not be there. That mm-hmm. don't have the budget, that don't have the the mindset, that aren't thinking that way. And then we're wondering what the pro, why are, why is this not working? Why is it such a struggle? Why are they shopping me? Why? Won't they spend any money? It's because that's not what they should have ever been put into, right? That's awesome. I love that. I love right there. We're going to go right back. I'm going to say it again. Why are they shopping me? Why won't they let me do things I want to do? Why is because they don't belong in the full service model. They should never have been there, right, ever. Right. Ever. And the thing is, they're entitled to interior design expertise, but your expertise is super valuable and it can't be dumbed down and it cannot become a, a, a commodity that is given right. away cheaply, but you can figure out a way to, you know, it's funny because I had a conversation recently with a consultant and I literally hung up the phone and I thought, this is exactly what potential interior design clients go through. And the designer needs to understand this moment here because I had an expectation of what was going to happen. It's kind of like when a potential client calls a designer and there's this little thing in the back of the head that says, I kind of really need this service. I want an expert to walk me through this, but I'm really afraid of what this is going to cost. And I'm afraid to ask the question of what kind of budget I should allow to work with this person. Right. And so for me, I'm on the flip side. It's a consultant. I'm calling them and I'm saying, you know, this is sort of what I need. This is sort of what you know, I've recommended to you, yada, yada. And my brain is saying, 
please don't be a lot of money because I really need you. And I don't want, you know, I mean, I, I just <laughs> right. really need you in yeah, my life I right now. I all the and, time. Yeah. Like, and I'm saying, to me, please not let it right. be seven, And I'm saying, $1,000. I want like 700. Yeah. I'm saying like, am I going to like bite the bullet when they say, cause I need it so much. Am I going right. to wait and you know, okay, now I know how much it is. Let me go collect my shekels and I'll be back in six months. And right. you know, what was interesting, Toby, this just happened this week. I made the connection as we were talking. The consultant said to me, well, I've been through several different business models, and this is the one that has been working for me successfully for the last year and a half. She said, this is my hourly rate. Call me, and whenever you need me, you pay the hourly rate. And she said, you want one phone call a week? You want three phone calls a week? You want one a month? You don't want to talk to me for six months. You got something that has to do with my expertise that you need help with, you you email me, I give you my link, you get in my calendar, and you pay me. And I was just like, whoa. I just, I mean, I literally can visualize calling this person next week because right. I have a question on this expertise. I know what it's going to cost. I have one hour of her time. It will get solved or we're not. And here's what I also, I literally said this to myself after I hung up the phone. I thought, if this person is good at her job, I will probably lean on her three, four, five, six times over the next six months. I will get good service. I will get good information. And then I will right. say, can I put you on retainer? I know it. I know as sure yeah. as I'm standing here. And that's so exactly the journey that you're describing. Allow well, the client yeah. to enter your process at the level they, they're they prepared to be in because if they ever are truly that full service client, there's no loss there. They're not going to be like, well, I, you know, I did a room for a day with you for a thousand dollars. Why should I spend $5,000 now for all of this? They'll understand the value. They'll get it. Yeah. And what the designer needs to understand is we're not saying that they, again, take their, their full service design and part, part and parcel it up to an hour at a time and drive to their house in an hour. No, you sit at your desk and right. they pick your brain on the phone or right. on a Zoom call and you get paid well for it. Probably more than you'd get paid if you were actually charging an hourly rate. That you know, I mean, I'd charge a premium for it. Exactly. I mean, like, yeah, this is not a full want. on charge strategy program. If you want to, I mean, whatever the value is to, that really works for you and the customer, if you're giving that much value, they're going to keep calling you again. Mm -hmm. But, but we're not saying like start work, drive, all over town for a hundred dollars an hour here and a hundred dollars an hour there. No, but when you can start to see, okay, how do I how do I give them what they want? Like I said from about Zig Ziglar, the way to help people, pe the way to get what you want is to help other people get what they want. Right. So that's kind of what we're not real good at doing, and as an industry, and so the way to get them what they want does not mean that you have to let them call all the shots. And it doesn't mean that you have to give it in the way that you've seen it before of, well, how in the world, you know, could I go and give soup to nuts design for an hour here and an hour there? Well, you don't, but you, and then people, then I think that's where designers and creatives get stuck too, because we want to believe that we can't give any good advice unless we have all of the information and we're controlling the whole thing. Right. Right. You know what I mean? So right. we're like, well, I couldn't possibly do that. Okay, well, maybe you're not picking a paint color for this person. Maybe you decide ahead of time what cannot be given on the phone and right. what can. And you know, you know what you can successfully do not being on site. And if it requires being on site, I'm sorry, that's only part of our full service process exactly. because I can't possibly do that on the phone. Exactly. But here's what I can do on the phone. Right. And and that's what you do because people want that stuff too. I mean, it is not nearly as complicated as what we think, but the problem is we're not really in the business a lot of times of solving the client's actual problems. We want to tell the client what all we think they should have. And that's what we want to solve. And I think that's where the disconnect is. And I think that's why these other businesses are popping up that will help the customer because they only want this or that. And we think that, well, if we can just get them in the door, then we'll ride in on our white horse and we'll talk them into doing the whole room for $30,000 when they really only needed this. Right. Um, I've again, had that experience with designers before in coaching calls where their project has not, they have not gotten the project because the 
they're not they it's not listening in other words there are times when someone will very clearly tell you what they want i want a room refresh or i want this and then Mm -hmm. we come back with this entire plan and sometimes that's good you know but the point is you have to understand and read your client because you know, there have been situations where I'm literally privy to lost the project because they oversold it. And right. the person just like kind of looked at me as like, I just wanted this, that, and the what other thing. What did you not yeah. understand right. about $5,000, right? Right, right? Or right. to me, if I, if I get in and I think, okay, they really want more, then I'll say, you know what? It seems sounds like. to me <laughs> like you need a lot more and maybe even want a lot more than right. what you're saying. Would you be okay with me showing a full design scheme? That's right. what I would do. And then if they're like, oh, sure then that's one thing. Right. Um, and here's the other thing I want to be clear about too. Just because we're talking about solving the client's smaller problems, that doesn't even have to mean that you ever speak to them in person at all. They could literally buy something from you, right. from your site, a course, a program, a book. Uh, I mean, there's so many different ways to solve people's problems. So if it seems like a total nightmare to you, because it does to me, to be, you know, like, like going backwards kind of and having to work in the types of projects that really would not be pleasant or fun for me, then just don't make that part of your service. Right, right. It, you don't know, it's not it. like I'm saying that you have to go to people's houses that have a $5,000 budget. It's like, well, if that person comes in, then you set up, which we haven't even talked a lot about yet, but there's such a science and, and an art and a process to the whole digital marketing strategy. But when they come into your world, your funnel, you use the right language, the right digital assets to guide them to this other thing that they purchase that is all self-service. Right. Um, and the amount of money you can make from creating something like that can really blow your mind. And But we have a bias about it. We have a mindset against it of, you know, a real designer wouldn't do that. A sophisticated designer wouldn't do that. And I always laugh because I do all this stuff and I'm like, well, people are like, oh, you're amazing. <laughs> And a, but a sophisticated designer wouldn't do that. And I'm like, well, I'm doing that. Am I unsophisticated? Am I right. dumb? Because like, it sure feels good when I get the money for those. When I wake up in, the next morning and there's, you know, an extra $1,200 or 7000 in my in my right. Stripe account, I'm pretty right. dang happy about yes. that. Well, and the thing is, that is a whole nother animal to take on, to do it, to do it well and to take it on and to create that um, digital marketing funnel and to get them in with a, a good quality lead magnet. We've talked All about it that. on the show with several yeah. past guests and to get them right in with a good quality me lead magnet and then the whole email sequence and everything and yes. it is true it not only is there is a technically appropriate way to do it but then yes. there is a stylistically way to do it that reflects your brand your brand and really well, yeah, keeps you elevated it- like anything else, if you think it's just going to be a package thing, and you're just going to get this guy to build it for you or whatever, it's not going to convert for you. No. And you're going to be like, well, see, Toby was full of it and that <laughs> didn't work. Well, it's because you're, you're not supposed to just like create this thing that has no value. It's just another way of building a relationship with them. Mm-hmm. It's just, I mean, so it has to have real value, good right. stuff, right. you know, and you have to literally build, be building a relationship with them through the copy or the document or your social media or wherever it is that you're connecting with them. So um, let me ask you something. So we have this whole thing going on where the consumers have a lot more access to products and, you know, products and things in the marketplace. Um, whether we think it's good or bad, I think think we just are seeing like saying like it's sort of the writings on the wall whether where it is in five years is yeah, we, don't we don't know control it right we have no control that's over the point. It, whether we like it or not that's the point point. and so the thing is that your message is to just be aware that the industry is changing and yes. rather than stand there in the middle of the field and say stop changing figure out your way to move and change within it and to diversify the way you earn money so that you are not left by the wayside. Yes, and even before that or besides that, like so many people are so miserable in parts of their jobs right now that have already changed. Stop doing those things if they're <laughs> miserable. I mean, honestly, like what we're just like self 
self-flagellation and suffering. And like, if it's that miserable, like who said that when you decided to have a design business that you had to provide all of those services, right? You get to decide, you get to decide, you might just say, we don't even do accessorizing. We don't sell furniture or we don't do floor plans. You can hire draftsmen for that. I mean, I'm just making this up. Right. You're making things up. Parts don't work for you. Then why are you continuing to be miserable? Right. Right. And I mean, look, I, I have used this one example many, many times. Of course, I have so many new listeners in the last three months, so I'll share it again, is that there is a, des- a designer locally to me here that told me she strictly, strictly consult and hourly fees, period. Does yes. not make any purchases, does not hire any contractors. Now, she has her cadre of contractors and vendors that she likes. I'm one of mm-hmm. them, right? Mm-hmm. She has a, pa- a paper hanger that she likes, and, you know, she has an electrician that she likes. But the contract is always me to the client. She doesn't run any paperwork through her business other than her hourly fee. And she yeah. w- she she books out at a couple of hundred, a little over a couple of hundred dollars an hour. And she probably works about 20 hours a week. You do the math. It's not bad. You know, it's well, she's a, probably making more than a lot of people who are running themselves in the ground, the running ragged, getting huge jobs and running all this furniture and procurement through their businesses and making a 17% profit margin on it. If you do 20 hours a week at $200 an hour, and you take, here we go, 20 hours a week times $200 times, let's say, 48 weeks. That's 192 grand. And most designers I know are not making anywhere Think close that. to that amount of money. Think I mean, like that. they're lucky if they're making sixty or $70,000 yeah. a year. And the thing is, when she leaves, she's not doing a floor plan. You know, she's not sourcing things for you because here's how she'll source things for you. Okay, I'll go to the store with you to find it. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? Like, you'll pay me to go into the store with you. She doesn't say, okay, I'm going to shop at three stores and I'm going to do my homework or I'm going to sit online and I'm going to research this. No, it's all real time. And she's, she comes from an entrepreneurial background and she's very clear, very clean cut. She doesn't stress herself out. She doesn't work at 10-hour t- days. And every single time she's on the appointment with the client, she always pulls out her appointment book, Toby, and she says, okay, so the next step in the process, okay, we had Luann here for the draperies. The next step is to get the cabinet guy here to give us an estimate on making the bookcases. I have Tuesday at 2 or Wednesday at 11. Which day works for you? Boom. (laughs) It's awesome. I watch, I'm like, she's a master. I just go, you know, I just kneel down at her feet. I'm like, whoa. (laughs) No employees, no, you know, no broken furniture. Because she's like, oh, I'm sorry that came in broken. I guess you'll call them and return it, huh? (laughs) Exactly. Well, and the thing is, I think that for me, the message is not that whoever's listening to this episode of the podcast is now like, okay, Toby says we need to stop doing all of this stuff this afternoon. What I really want people to do is just create a business that is right for them. I want you to actually tune in and go, what do I like about my business? What do I hate about my business? What makes me money? Does anything make me money? Do I even know if anything makes me money? And what what are my clients asking me for that I am not giving them or willing to give them? And could I get creative? Is there another way that we could solve that problem for them that would actually add value to them and value to me? Um, That's just, that's what I want people looking at because we're very entrenched in how things have always been done, especially if we aspire to be a certain level of designer. And I think so many of those opportunities and things have changed themselves too, right? I mean, when I got into design, of course, I wanted to get published in major magazines. I wanted to have product lines. I wanted, and I've done all of that. But if I was a designer coming up right now, would I be doing all of that? Not in those same ways because that a lot of those opportunities have changed, right? Right, right, right. So, I think the, the, the most important thing that you said right there, especially piggybacking on the business model that I shared with my friend here is that it there is no one way 
But the thing is, you said, tune in to what do you like and what do you want to do and what do you want your business to be? Because I am definitely not advocating either that business model, the fact that I bring it up so often. it's I'm not advocating for it. Look, I work with it's Sandra just Funk. It's fascinating, right? right. And I work with Sandra Funk every day of the week. And Sandra Funk would never want that business model. She no. wants to design to completion. She exactly. wants it to be every single part of it, absolutely the perfect piece. She doesn't want to say to somebody, you need a six foot sofa and an eight foot rug and then walk in the next week and go, sort of not that one, but okay, I'll move on and work. There's this, it is, what do you want? This other woman wants a clean business, wants to make an X amount of dollars. She knows that she's helping people who would never contract for full service interior design. She's making their, helping them make their rooms more beautiful. It is, how do you want it to be? And what you're saying is, is you can figure it out. Right. Yes. And how do you want it to be? And also, if you're trying the other model, like you said, that Sandra has and this what I call soup to nuts and it's not working for you and it's more trouble than it's worth. And you're thinking about quitting and you don't know where your next paycheck is going to come from. And why does this have to be so hard? Then that's a sign for you to tune in and look at what's happening, what you're doing, what's making you money. Um, and I think that we kind of have a lot of times there's so many people living in that space right now of it's harder than ever. And it's not fun and they're not making money. And and so basically they're kind of either burned out or they're thinking about, I mean, I talk to people every week. They're like, I think I'm getting out of design now. I, yeah. I just am not willing to do it anymore. Yeah. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of, of rungs on the ladder between full service, like luxury interiors. And I have to quit this job. Yes. <laughs> well, that's the truth. That's you you, you know, that's, right? th- p- that is it in a nutshell right there. There are a lot of l- lot of steps and a lot of p- points on that road from super high-end luxury to I can't do this and I've got to leave the industry or quit or super high-end luxury and the whole industry has gone kaput and there's no way to make money in it anymore. You know, the right. idea is to be as creative as you are in your interiors. Get creative about your business. Exactly. Get real about your business, about what you really want it to look like and craft it. There's no like designer, you know, police that are going to come out and say, that's not the way a designer model should look is your point, right? Karen, what everybody else thinks about you, because like at the end of the day, like if somebody thinks, well, that's sure is cheesy that she, you know, did that service or that thing. And and one of my favorite books is called you're a badass at making money. And Mm. it's by this life coach, Jen Sincero, I think. And she says, would you rather be rich and cheesy or cool and poor? (laughs) But then we have such strict standards yes. in our industry of what we think is cool right. and what's allowed and and we're, we kind of tend to be a little snobby and a little judgy not meaning like we're bad people but we just have these really high standards and anything that seems like out of the box or weird is not what we do uh, and so I just want people to just open their minds mm-hmm. to the possibility just to open your mind just like and don't think well I saw this one really horrible thing online and because people are so, well call me and like they'll hear this message or they'll join a coaching program and then they're like so are you saying that we just all need to create a course online that's like less than two hundred dollars of how to decorate and I'm like no (laughs) (laughs) you don't all need to do that absolutely not because there's gonna you know what there's gonna be in like five years from now like five billion of those just like there were when the blogging started and then there were five billion blogs You need to create something of value that you're passionate about that solves a problem for a specific group of people that lights you up when you do it and that makes a happy customer that makes you money. Right. You can't just do it because it's the thing to do. It can't. Right. Because it won't be authentic. Doing like design in a box. And I think that's one of the least profitable models because if it's a custom design for less than what a custom design costs, you're going to lose money every time. It's not sustainable, but everybody needed one. I tried it too, right? Right. Um, Everybody got on that. And that's not what I'm saying. It's not like, oh, everybody better get a course now and everybody better have a this or that. But it's just, you've got to get online. You've got to think digitally. Your customer is online. So whether your service that you're providing happens through an online way or in, in person, you've got to be getting with the program with digital marketing and showing up out there and meeting their needs. Um, And there's just so much to it. Gosh, we could have, 
five podcast yeah. episodes. We could yeah. talk about what the website looks like. We could talk about what the marketing strategy looks like. We could talk about the whole mindset piece that holds you back. And when you start creating this content and putting out in the world, you're going to freak out and it's going to feel really uncomfortable, but that's growth. And then when you get it out there and people love it, I mean, do you think I'll freaked out when I've created everything I've ever done? Of right. course. Like right. I, when I started business coaching, I'm like, oh my God, all the designers are going to think I'm I'm such a weirdo. And then I got a life coach certification and I brought that into a no program. I'm like, oh my God, they're going to think I'm such a flake. But guess what? Some people probably do, but all the people that are using my program think I'm changing their lives. So that's all that really really matters. No, you got it. You got to do you. That's the bottom line. You got to do you. Exactly. (laughs) Whatever it is, if it's running your business, you know, uh, running through your life, doing whatever you're doing, it has to be because that's where the magic happens when you really are passionately, like you said, passionately connected to what it is you're creating. And but then there's that component of it that is it a good business model? Is it a viable thing? And then when you can get that sweet spot where they intersect the passion and the smartness of the that it's solving a problem, that it's changing someone's life, it's making making their life easier, better, faster, yes. whatever it is, and you have a passion for it, that's the sweet spot. So Yeah, and I think that one, one last thing there is that so often we're more attached to the design product, project, full service, like finished product yeah um and what it does for our ego and how our our customers so happy and we get to feel that really good yummy feeling for just a minute when they're just over the the moon that we're more attached to that than we are at being profitable right um and so we sacrifice money consistently but then we're always frustrated of why it's so broken and why we never make any money. So you have to think about, and you about you and I have spoken about that even on my podcast. Mm-hmm. Like, the, it's not all about money, but it's got to at least be about money at a basic level. You've got to be at least making a certain amount of money, or it's not sustainable. No, no, because then it is a legitimate hobby, and yeah. you know. And the thing about it is, you can have a legitimate hobby. Just call it that. Understand that it's that. Enjoy that it that it's what it is. Understand. Exactly. Don't be frustrated that it doesn't make you money because. And don't explain yourself because it's right. none of everybody's business, that's right? right? You can do what you want to. That's right. right. That's the point. Mm-hmm. It's just own it. Own whatever you're doing. So if you're if you are happy to give your services away because it brings you joy, that that's great. But then don't complain you're making mo- not making money. And if right. you wait, <laughs> I mean you, yeah. you've decided it's a hobby. It's okay. You know, right. I, nobody pays me to go running. You know, it's a hobby. <laughs> I do it because I, well, I used to do it. My darn hip now. <laughs> I don't get to do it as much. Yeah, well, and you know what else? On that note, don't apologize for making money in a different way than other people that you have seen in the industry. Just like this lady you just described her business model. Mm-hmm. Love it or hate it. Right. Like, I think it's pretty dang brilliant and gutsy that she's willing to run her business that way. Oh my God. And she's the years. one taking it all the way to the bank. Yeah, right? She don't care. She yeah. does. She does not give one iota what anybody thinks of her business model because you know what? She leaves the house at nine 30 every morning. She's back at three o'clock every day. She doesn't take any appointments after three o'clock and she works <laughs> five days a week yeah. in and out. And when she doesn't want to work, she closes her calendar. Boom. And she's not sitting around going, what's going to happen when I don't have any vendors and are the vendors going to be mad at me and am yeah. I never going to be able to buy a sofa? And yeah. like, what if I can't get a wholesale account and what, like she's not even doing any of that. Stuff and the thing at all. is when, a, when a customer will say to her, Oh, well, can't can't you purchase this for me? She just says no. <laughs> she doesn't just. She doesn't justify it. She, she goes. That's not how, how I many work. People are still hiring her because that's good enough for yeah. them. That's what they're looking for. That's all they need. Yeah, yeah. And that's the, what the I, biggest, that's, the most yeah. noticeable thing about her is, to your point, is that she's very clear on what she wants to do, what she will do, what she will charge for doing it, and she doesn't care. If you don't want that, it doesn't matter to her. She'll refer you to one of our colleagues. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Exactly. Yes. It's awesome. And it's the same thing for the same thing. I use the example of Sandra. And of course, we have Jenny Madden and we have other um, luxury high-end interior designers here. You know, for the person that wants to buy an hour or two hours of their time, like that's, I'm not your girl. I'm full service. It's the same thing. It's what you said. Tune in to what you like and how you want your business to be. 
Yeah. Yes. And Love I it. I mean, like I live in a small state, so there's not like I don't live in New York or Dallas where I could just literally fill my pipeline with those big, big jobs every day. I would have to travel all over the country. And I have and I do occasionally. But then I hit a point in my life where I'm like, I'm tired of missing my family. I'm mm-hmm. tired of being gone from my house. I'm tired of not having time for yoga. You know, so I made decisions. <laughs> just <to> tired. Go- <laughs> exactly. So then I'm like, OK, well, then I want to I don't want to give up design. It's not an either or for me. I don't have to say, okay, well, I quit. I can say, you know what? I'm going to take three jobs a year or four jobs a year or Mm -hmm. one job a year. And then I'm going to do something else with my gifts and my talents and solve a problem for someone in a way that makes me money. And it's so fun and it gives me time freedom and I can work from anywhere. Um, And so for me, that's been the right mix. Had I lived in a big city, which I didn't want to move to, and my and I had, you know, had I not had trouble filling the pipeline to make this kind of salary I wanted, would I have gone this route? I have no idea. I don't know. Maybe because right. maybe I would have still been tired dealing with all of the details that come <laughs> with having that many design projects. But I just listened to me and I'm like, what do I want right now? Mm-hmm. And maybe what I wanted when I was 27 is not what I want when I'm 47. And I I'm completely give myself permission. And it's, I don't, I don't feel embarrassed about it. I don't feel like I'm not legit anymore. I don't feel like I'm no longer really a designer or anything like that. I'm right. just like, I'm doing new things. I'm exploring new ways of doing it. I'm having fun. I'm looking at opportunities. I'm making people happy. I'm making me happy. Um, it's all and good I'm, stuff. It's important I'm really, stuff. I'm really confident to, to be in that spot. And kind of, back to kind of makes me more proud of myself, that I figure things out that work mm-hmm. for me, right. myself, my family, my customers. And that's just what I love to empower other people, especially other women to do. Mm-hmm. is to figure out how to get the stuff you want, the stuff they want, mm-hmm. um, and make that work together. Yeah, absolutely. I love it, Toby. Well, let me tell you what. You're a powerhouse. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I thank you so much. Two, so What's that? that? I have an opinion or two. Yeah, just a little. Just a little bit. I don't want to imply that I'm judging the way anybody else is doing their stuff. I'm really not. I'm just trying to solve some problems for some of the people who are struggling and their model's not working. I'm just trying to give people options and show them, you know, that they can do things different ways and just kind of giving them that, that support and that permission to, to do it differently. Right. To just think out of the box and, and dream a little bit about what would your interior design firm look like if you really did all the things that you wanted to do and considered not doing the things that you don't enjoy doing. Could you reimagine your business model to support that? So it's, yes. it's, a, it's a worthy exploration to at least attempt to do. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for coming here today. I really appreciate it, Toby. Gosh, I feel like every time we get on the phone together, I just feel like we could have like an eight, like we could literally have a whole all day conference. It's like we trip. could have a, we could have like a summit because we could just keep going. It is so true. It is so true. I thank you so much. Have a great day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon, Luann. You can hear how passionate Toby is about helping you design a business and a life that you love. Her exact line, you need to create something of value, something that you are passionate about that solves a problem, that lights you up, and when you do it, it makes you money. The other ideas from Toby that stand out include to not apologize for making money if you're doing it differently than colleagues that you know. Toby emphasized there are a lot of rungs on the ladder between full service luxury and I have to close my business. And finally, one of the most practical ideas from Toby is don't be more attached to the final product than about making money. This means Very specifically, if you are killing it at one-off consults or designer for a day or any model that is working for you, own it. Own it all the way to the bank. If you'd like more information on creating digital products to support your design business and help you make money in a less traditional way, even if you'd like to explore this idea to diversify your income streams, be sure to check out the new book, my new book, A Well-Designed Business, The Power Talk Friday Experts. It is available on Amazon or you can go to luannnigara.com slash book two. In the book, Kay Whitaker 
outlines the client journey, which is exactly the first step in understanding digital marketing. So it's a great uh, place to get your feet wet if what Toby is saying is intriguing you. Now, let's not forget how My Doma Studio fits right into this discussion too. My Doma Studio is not only perfect for managing your projects efficiently and productively, it is perfect for creating digital design packages which you can either use as a marketing lead magnet or that you can sell to your clients. Be sure to go to mydomastudio.com slash a well-designed business. That's my Doma Studio dot com slash a well-designed business. All righty. Thank you so much for joining me today. I was so excited to speak to Toby. It's been my great pleasure to get to know her over this last year, especially like I said, it's somebody that I have long admired and never in my wildest dreams that I think I would one day call friend. So I hope you enjoyed the episode. Please check out her podcast. Let Toby know what you thought. Share your love with her on Instagram. And um, just give it a thought. What's going to be your decision today? How are you going to take action on what you learned today? Because you know I need you to decide to be excellent. Thank you so much for joining me again today. This podcast is a production of Window Works, your resource for custom window treatments and awnings. To learn how we can help you on your next interior design project, go to www.windowworks-nj.com. And if you're interested in working with me on your business, either through masterminds or one-on-one coaching, or you want to know how to get my book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, or you just want to know what's going on in the podcast land, and where I'm going to be. All of that is found at luannnigara.com. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day.